Understanding Women Part 5 Published on August 5, 2012, by Carl Donk Almost a year ago, I wrote the first part of this article series on understanding women. Shortly after publishing the first part, I wrote three more parts, where I dived into some of the background information and details that I left out of the first part in order to keep it relatively short. Since then I've discovered more information on the subject that I want to discuss in this fifth part of this series. Not too long after publishing the fourth part of this series, I was surprised to find an interview online with, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant men to have lived on this planet, Nikola Tesla. If you don't know who Nikola Tesla is, you may want to read up on him. Tesla has become somewhat of a legend especially on the internet. A lot of the technology that we take for granted and use today is all due to Tesla's groundbreaking work in the field of electromagnetism. But Tesla wasn't just a physicist and engineer, he was also a futurist and philosopher. And this becomes clear in this interview he did in 1926 titled, When Woman is Boss, where he also talked about women. In this interview Tesla mentions some very interesting things that reveal he must have thought about the subject of women for a long time during his life. Quote, Mr. Tesla regards the emergence of woman as one of the most profound portents for the future. It is clear to any trained observer, he says, and even to the sociologically untrained, that a new attitude towards sex discrimination has come over the world through the centuries, receiving an abrupt stimulus just before and after the World War. This struggle of the human female towards sex equality will end in a new sex order, with the female as superior. The modern woman, who anticipates in merely superficial phenomena the advancement of her sex, is but a surface symptom of something deeper and more potent fermenting in the bosom of the race. It is not in the shallow physical imitation of men that women will assert first their equality and later their superiority, but in the awakening of the intellect of women. Through countless generations, from the very beginning, the social subservience of women resulted naturally in the partial atrophy, or at least the hereditary suspension of mental qualities, which we now know the female sex to be endowed with no less than men. The queen is the center of life. But the female mind has demonstrated a capacity for all the mental acquirements and achievements of men, and as generations ensue that capacity will be expanded, the average woman will be as well educated as the average man, and then better educated, for the dormant faculties of her brain will be stimulated to an activity that will be all the more intense and powerful because of centuries of repose. Woman will ignore precedent and startle civilization with their progress. End quote. It is important to note that Tesla himself saw that the social subservience of women through countless generations, and from the very beginning, resulted in the issues women are having today. This is exactly what I said in the first part of this series. Tesla's genius goes so far as to realize that there's a hereditary suspension of mental qualities in women. Although this is also the case, not just in women, but humans in general, and details on this can be found in Michael Tellinger's book Slave Species of God, the suspension of mental qualities related to the issues I discuss in this article series have more to do with the system of brainwash that exists in society rather than any hereditary issues. I discussed in more details in the second part of this series how we're being mentally manipulated through our sexual desires. But it is amazing that Tesla was able to detect that the issues with women were the result of mental problems, even though this was not his main field of research. He also correctly identified the struggle of the human female towards sex equality, which is something I also mentioned in the first part of this series when I said that. Quote, Women are difficult to understand because they are constantly struggling internally with the conflict between what they have been taught about themselves and their true nature. End quote. The true nature of women is that they are equal to men, especially when it comes to their sexuality, more on this later below. In the fourth part of this series I showed how normal women behave just like men with regard to their sexuality. After being brainwashed from very early childhood to believe that they should behave differently and suppress their needs, 
women struggle most of their lives with the internal conflict this creates, which further leads to mental problems and difficult, irrational and unpredictable behavior. Tesla predicted that women will ignore precedent and startle civilization with their progress. And we can already see that happening today, especially with the younger generations of women. This is mostly due to the fact that we are now in a phase of global awakening where a lot of previously hidden information is starting to become available and people start to change their thinking as a result of that. For details on this, read my article on the global brain. Keep in mind that a lot of the things Tesla said in this interview all the way back in 1926 have become reality today, including that which he said about planet Earth becoming a huge brain. I expect that much of what he said in that interview about women will also become reality in the very near future. I am already seeing much of it around me. Young women are becoming smarter and are starting to see the stupidity of the rules in society. However, I don't think women will become superior to men, as Tesla says. I think there will be equality and mutual respect, and we'll probably have a society similar to Iceland, where women enjoy the same sexual freedoms as men. I wrote about this in the fourth part of this series. What's also interesting about Tesla's interview is that he compares women with the queen in the civilization of a bee. A strange coincidence since I discussed the fairy queen from the movie, the never-ending story in the third part of this series. And take note of the lyrics I discussed from one of the songs related to the movie where a young girl sings about wanting to become a fairy queen. Quote, If I could be a fairy queen, then I would hold a magic key to reveal the hidden secrets of the mind. Then I could see the darkest blue, the mystery that's part of you, and I'd weave a spell to take away your sorrows. End quote. So here we have a young girl singing about unlocking the hidden secrets of the mind, if she could be a fairy queen, and we have Tesla mentioning how women, once they awaken their intellect, will become like the queen in the civilization of a bee. See the similarities. Is it just coincidence? Maybe you won't think so, once you read about the real deal behind the fairy queen in the third part of this series. Because, in fact, the movie, The Never-Ending Story, is exactly about the social subservience of women through countless generations, from the very beginning that Tesla was talking about. Another thing I want to discuss is a review article titled Women, Men, and the Bedroom, which was published in an issue of Current Directions in Psychological Science, a journal of the Association for Psychological Science. This article, written by University of Michigan psychology professor Terry Conley, and her team of graduate students, was published in October 2011 just a few months after I published the first part of this series on understanding women. The research discussed in this article leads to very interesting conclusions which show that there's not much difference between men and women when it comes to their sexuality. This is something that I said in the very first part of this series, it is what Nikola Tesla claimed in the interview above, and now we have research showing this is the case. Quote, the idea behind this subject occurred to Conley and her team who felt that psychology needed a more eclectic and representative perspective on contemporary relations between men and women. In short, the driving force behind this article was that people typically think that men are sex-grazed and women are sexually prudish, however, we believe that these descriptions may not paint the picture of how men and women typically behave, says Conley and her co-authors. After reviewing the various literatures, Conley and her co-authors arrived at several conclusions regarding gender differences in sexuality, which demonstrated that none of the original assumptions people have had about how men and women engage in sex, think about sex and desire sex are not as compelling and well-founded as previously believed. We expect people to be surprised by the small or, in some places completely absent gender differences, says Conley and her co-authors. End quote. What Conley and her team did is that they also considered the influence that society has on people's thoughts and decisions. And this is very important. I mentioned this in the fourth part of this series. Quote. Now, 
You may say that many studies that have been done recently show that men have a greater sex drive than women. For example, in a talk by Professor Roy F. Baumeister, he says, Look at research on the sex drive. Men and women may have about equal ability in sex, whatever that means, but there are big differences as to motivation, which gender thinks about sex all the time, wants it more often, wants more different partners, risks more for sex, masturbates more, leaps at every opportunity, and so on. Our survey of published research found that pretty much every measure and every study showed higher sex drive in men. It's official, men are hornier than women. This is a difference in motivation. And this is true. But would this still be true today if the system of brainwash and sexual repression that targets women had not been in place for thousands of years now? I think you know the answer to that question yourself. As I have discussed in the first part of this series, society still forces and brainwashes women into repressing their sexual desires leading to all kinds of psychological issues, which makes women difficult to understand and difficult to live with. If you put a system into place that makes women repress their sexual desires for thousands of years, then of course, if you're going to do a survey today you'll find that women have less sexual desire than men. Any survey about sex drive done today is essentially flawed because it doesn't take this female sexual repression that is built into society into account. It has had a lot of impact on women. It's like teaching kids in school that 1 plus 1 equals 3, and then a survey finding out 30 years later that most people think that 1 plus 1 equals 3. End quote. If the influence that society has on people isn't taken into account, the results from surveys won't ever be fully and correctly understood. I want to discuss a few of the conclusions from Conley's review article below, but for all the details read the full article. The first conclusion. Quote. Do women desire and actually have fewer sexual partners than men do? Bottom line, do women desire and actually have fewer sexual partners than do men? No, gender differences in reported sexual partners stem less from sexual appetites and more from inappropriate use and interpretation of statistics and social desirability. End quote. It's very important to note here that women apparently desiring less sexual partners is not because of less sexual appetite in women. It's also not true that women desire less sexual partners compared to men. In fact, their conclusion shows that the majority of men and women desire a similar number of sexual partners, namely one. The second conclusion. Quote. Do men think about sex more than women do? Fisher and colleagues suggested that men are more attentive to their own needs than women are. This is consistent with objectification theory, which suggests that women's focus on others' perceptions reduces women's attention to their own physical needs, Fredrickson and Roberts, 1997. And with ample research demonstrating men's socialization to be agentic and self-focused apprentice and Carranza, 2002. Women are socialized to be both more attuned to others' needs and are pressured to inhibit expression of their own desires, Helgeson and Fritz, 1999. Bottom line, do men think about sex more than women do? Yes, but they also think more about their own physical needs, overall. End quote. Here we see that the important reason why men think more about sex than women is because society pressures women to inhibit a restrain expression of their own desires. This is exactly what I have said from the very beginning in the first part of this series, namely that women are forced by society to suppress and even repress their sexual desires. And like I've shown in the fourth part of this series, normal women who aren't influenced by society want sex just as much as men do. However, in that case they are called nymphos and treated as if they are sick. The third conclusion. Quote, do men like casual sex more than do women? Most strikingly, when both propose a sexual capabilities and stigma associated with participation in casual sex are accounted for, the giant gender differences in acceptance evaporate completely. Bottom line, do men like casual sex more than women do? 
Yes, but those differences can be explained by the proposer's sexual capabilities and women's anticipation of being stigmatized for accepting the offer. End quote. Here we once again see the influence all the brainwashing and the rules of society have on women. If women weren't afraid of being stigmatized by society and called whores, sluts or nymphos when they satisfy their sexual desires, then they would like casual sex as much as men do. I've discussed this in the fourth part of this series where I talk about the women from Iceland. But I've recently also touched upon this subject when I wrote an article titled Why Men and Women Can't Be Just Friends. The fact that women are being stigmatized for having casual sex is one of the important reasons why it's difficult for men and women to be just friends. The fourth conclusion. Quote, are women choosier than men? Men typically pursue women rather than vice versa, following a traditional gender stereotyped and culturally bound, Ryan and Jetha, 2010, Social Script, for example, Lena and Ventrone, 2000, Rose and Fries, 1989. Therefore, women are approached more often than men are. Assumptions about women's choosiness have been based on our culture's traditional gender dynamics. Bottom line, are women choosier than men? Yes, but potentially only because they are approached more often than men are. End quote. So the fact that men are expected to pursue women is something that is the result of a traditional and gender stereotyped and culturally bound social script. It is important to realize that this has nothing to do with nature or the natural behavior of men and women. In fact, in the fourth part of this series I discussed the situation in Iceland where it's quite normal for women to pursue men. The fact that in some societies and cultures women spend their lives waiting for men to make the first move, or for the perfect man to turn up, is all due to the brainwashing that they received ever since their childhood of how things are supposed to be. These unrealistic expectations lead to all kinds of issues between men and women as discussed in the first part of this series. And then there's the overall conclusion of the article. Quote, Within psychology, perspectives that draw upon adaptively evolved mechanisms, Buss and Schmidt, 1993, Eagley and Wood, 1999, are typically utilized to explain gender differences in sexuality. That is, the behaviors we see today are presumed to be relics of our evolutionary past. The research reviewed suggests that these gender differences are in fact rooted in much more mundane causes, stigma against women for expressing sexual desires, women's socialization to attend to others' needs rather than their own, and, more broadly, a double standard that dictates different sets of appropriate sexual behaviors for men and women. End quote. So the truth is that men and normal women do not differ when it comes to their sexual desires. In fact, they have a very similar sex drive. Yes, surprise surprise, men and women really are basically the same. All of us have the same basic needs as human beings. The differences we do see between men and women are due to the various issues and rules in society that influence women. And these are the root causes of all the mental issues women in general are exhibiting, which result in their difficult to understand behavior, as discussed in the first part of this series. Dr. Freud wondered his entire life about women. Quote, the great question that has never been answered, and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? End quote. Well, Mr. Freud, women, normal women, to be precise, want exactly the same things as men. Thank you for listening. This article was originally published on Carl Donk's blog at blog.carldonk.com. Remember to visit for regular updates. You can also find this content published on archive.org and lbry.tv. Remember to save a local copy of this video and any other content that you would like to continue to have access to in the future.
You never know, those goddamn motherfuckers in big tech might censor this content in the future.